the nerdy architect. Hey there. So today we're going to talk about something really serious. Yep, serious talk today. Wait a second. So yeah, today's topic is going to be a bit different and a bit heavy and it's going to be a little less pop culture nerdy. Also I didn't make this video to make construction professionals feel guilty about their work but it is made in order to inform them and educate them about the consequences of our actions. So with all that said, let's go to Singapore. So we are in Singapore, one of the most beautiful cities in the world, a shining beacon of development and progress. Architecture wise, the designs and the innovations are second to none. I will even call it the New York of Asia. Singapore is a city I have admired for a really long time. But Singapore is also an island and initially that is where my concerns began. Being an island, many species of flora and fauna found in Singapore are found nowhere else. A study suggests during its course of development, Singapore has lost more than half of all its species. Many of them unique and found only on the island, vanished forever, never to be seen again. Wild tigers, gone. Native leopards, gone. This small thing, deleted. It's not gotta cast them all over there in Singapore, it's gotta delete them all. 95% of the original natural vegetation and forests of Singapore have also been lost. Of course, there are replanted trees around the buildings and green grass on the lawn, but that cannot be counted as wild nature. Let's see, the artificial trees in the gardens by the bay, good for the tourists and the business, but built at what cost? Our governments, they can make plans to regreen the city by 2030 or hey, back to nature by 2040. But the countless dead species, all those whose blood are on our hands, we can wash off the blood and cover the carcass, but we can't yet make the dead rise up from the graves. This is not just a story of Singapore, this same story is shared by many cities we have built across the world. And this is not just limited to the cities, our infrastructure, our farmlands, everything we humans need has done the same. Nature is displaced for miles around the roads as animals are forced to retreat or become roadkill. Cities, every other forms of construction and transformation of natural land into agricultural land also have this similar effect. An alarming piece of information from this book, Bright Green Lies, an estimated 5.5 million vertebrates become roadkill each day and 2 billion vertebrates die on the road each year. Also an estimated 228 trillion insects die due to roads each year. This is an unfathomable number. The numbers we kill are decreasing every year only because there are fewer animals to kill. According to The Guardian, in the last 50 years of our development since the 1970s, we have managed to kill 70% of all wildlife population worldwide. This decline is a lot more in developing parts of the world. In past 50 years, leading the pack with whooping 96% wildlife killed is the Latin Americas. Africa comes second with 66% killed and Asia Pacific comes third with 55% killed. The more developed parts of the world like North America and Europe have killed 18-20% to of all their wildlife in past 50 years. But don't be fooled by this lower number. This is just because they have already killed most of everything in the past centuries. Now there's not much left to kill. So congratulations to us, yeah? The cost of our development is not just paid in money but paid by the death and extinction of life itself. Our architecture and the construction has been an unstoppable serial killer since the very dawn of human race. Hi there. So that was a heavy introduction right but if you're still willing to hear more then let's continue now i might be one of the strangest architect you ever met well one of them at least i suspect i've developed a building anxiety of a sort sounds stupid yeah it's probably stupid 
But I'll explain. As I found out, I'm not the only construction professional facing this issue. Most architects will design buildings, most of them will have to, majority of the times for money or for livelihood, at times even for recognition and fame. While some will build to make their designs into reality, which can also lead to inspiring people and contributing to the society, culture, etc. But me, as an architect, I have designed numerous structures or portion of the structures that have already been built and for me, it was the service I could provide in exchange for livelihood, recognition and portfolio. In the end, the one question I always end up asking is, should I or should I not have designed them? And this question sometimes renders me unable to justify my designs. And unless I can find some makeshift answers, I will have to find an excuse, which usually is if I don't do it, someone else will. And they might do it better, but the chances are they might do it a lot worse. There's also a more common second excuse. I tell myself, well it's my job and that's what my client wanted. Even then. Despite excuses, I always do ask, did I build right or are my designs harmful? And more importantly, in the long run, is the architecture I practice helping to kill the world? For me, the answer is I am uncertain, but I do know that if architects and planners were more considerate with their designs, how we live would definitely be different. And from the proof we have gathered, our designs might be helping to protect its residents, but they definitely are not helping protect the beings that live in its surrounding or the earth itself. So let's go back a few years ago when I was still trapped. I mean, I was still fulfilling my academic duties. One of my colleagues, a classmate, asked me for my opinion about building with abundance of nature, greenery and going back to being connected to nature through the practice of architecture. I mean, who didn't want to do it? Everyone wants to reconnect to the nature, to the society and to the people. It's a simple desire, something that the modern world allows to a very few people. But I, during my years as an academic and even before, I have been plagued with this thought and here I still am thinking about it continually. How is it so hard to stop our isolation with nature and to reconnect? How do I practice architecture so that it allows that to reconnect? And I was so frustrated that it erupted into a huge rant. And the semblances of that rant are as follows. Our anthropocentric world and our daily human activity is incompatible with the daily lives of many wild animals, not just because of the destruction of the habitat. Animals are forced to migrate miles away from the proximity of human activities, as their daily lives are turned sideways by the noises created by construction and the roar of vehicles. Birds can no longer sing the songs of mating and call their partners as our honks and hustle fills the air for the whole day and most birds, they are diurnal creatures. The sea turtles have lost their way heading towards the light of skyscrapers and street lamps rather than following the light of the moon reflected by the sea. Frogs, they can no longer hear each other croak come the rainy season, instead they get squashed while crossing the road. So many innocent deaths are caused by our construction, our roads and our vehicles. The numbers grow exponentially when we talk about the bugs and the insects. We never think about them when we start planning our buildings. Approximately around 2000 to 3000 bugs live in one square meter of area with vegetation. That's 1.19 square hours by the way. So. Thousands, even millions of them might be living even in a small site. We start building and thousands of homes of countless families just bulldozed over for a new home, most probably for a single family of humans. We have been so good at ignoring these small things and if you think about it, how much we have destroyed and displaced, especially the small, it's kind of alarming actually. Most of us, we only see and care for the bigger animals, as we can empathize with them a bit more easily. Even then, the bigger creatures also face the same problem, quickly adapt or phase into extinction. And even more, what about the weeds and the fungi? What about everything smaller, the things we cannot even comprehend at, but we build? We build nonetheless because we have to build and if we don't, we won't be able to sustain the needs of our growing population, so we are forced to. But it does not give us the right to be ignorant and we should try to change once we understand the impacts our actions cause. So if you ask me if there is any way to reconnect our architecture and our lifestyle to the primal nature by using the type of design we practice presently, my answer would be not possible. Let me ask you, if the nature does come close to you, are you even prepared to actually handle everything that will come with it? Really, really think about it because we are talking about that next.
The overarching issue with us connecting to the nature is, if you attempt to build around nature, then you'll be building among its inhabitants. Many of these beings of nature are built with their own defenses. Defenses that range from benign to irritable to even deathly to human beings. So right now what we do is we select a handful of species and permit them to be around us. We simply tolerate them. Crows, sparrows, pigeons, chipmunks, squirrels, cats, dogs, the benign ones, the ones that pose us less risk. In more developed places, we don't even tolerate the street dogs and stray cats. Good or bad, it's up to you. In day-to-day -day city life, it's hard to understand how invasive nature can be. For example, we sit in temperate climates and judge how people in tropics should build, and we forget about simple threats like mosquitoes. Just to prevent mosquitoes from getting into our residences and annoying us to our very cores, there are many precautions the residents and the designers need to take while designing a building. For example, double rivet doors with one door having a steel mesh net and a similar mesh net screen or panel in the windows and in the ventilation. Things like ear curtains to repel mosquitoes from entering open doorways vaporizing liquid mosquito repellent for daily use and this liquid could easily be toxic to us humans as well. Electric bug zappers in open areas to electrocute the mosquitoes and other bugs. You can't have ponds or outdoor pools because even with chlorinated pool water, mosquitoes are resilient enough to still use it as their breeding ground. Rainwater harvesting? Forget about it. More like you're harvesting mosquito larvae the whole monsoon. These things can grow into an adult in a single week. By the time you even start to use your harvested rainwater, a whole generation of them is unleashed. And this is just one variety we have to work so hard to repel and to design our daily life around. Not ticks, not fleas, just plain old mosquitoes. Even without the deathly plagues mosquitoes carry, just their presence is annoying enough. So our brilliant minds, our scientists have come up with desperate plans like hey let's make mosquitoes go extinct or let's neuter their whole population or let's genetically modify their whole population so even if they bite us, they, they at least cannot transmit the harmful diseases, right? This is just mosquitoes we're talking about here, just one family of species among many we share our day-to-day -day lives with, especially in the tropical areas. Nature, which we ignore or take for granted in day-to-day -day life, is only resilient till one tipping point. Some might even ask, do we even need to fix anything? But the reality is, things have actually changed this century. And if you live close to subtropical climatic zones, the change has been very visible. Dengue outbreaks in new places, places where people have been traveling back and forth for centuries, but the outbreaks have turned into endemics this century. This is just one example. We humans used to be a small part of nature, but now with our newfound powers, we can quickly alter the global natural condition by simply passing a law or by adapting a new mode of business, or worse, by starting a war. Just imagine human beings just like you and me, with nothing but an incomplete and biased worldview sitting in their chairs and making dangerous decisions. So now we return to the same age old question. Is there any way to fix this? And maybe, maybe there is. And let me try to piece everything I've gathered and put it together so you can see. We still practice construction in such a way that we build and the nature usually has to adapt around us and our infrastructures. We just cut and bulldoze through the nature and set up huge walls of concrete, disconnecting nature that was interconnected for eons. We have started being a lot more considerate in recent days because of how rare the nature surrounding us has become. But remember, if nature was around you more, then you would probably have accidental snakes crawling on your floors once in a while and hornets claiming your balcony as their nesting territory. We can hardly welcome the nature and expect to keep it under control at the same time. We need a new way of welcoming nature or the opposite to let the nature welcome us. So what we instead have to do is build not just our buildings but our infrastructures that connect our buildings in the most considerate way possible. Things we build should never disable and mutilate the surrounding nature. I was one of the haters of the New Homes Line City concept when it was first proposed. And even now, I cannot accept a project like this, especially being built in the Middle East. They have a well-known history of abusing laborers will be building this city. Many people from my own country have returned home in caskets, dead while working in the Middle East. But if the condition of workers does improve by some kind of miracle, I do want to see something like this project completed, even though just to see it fail like a big experiment, as it might teach us a lot of lessons. When I look at it through all the hype, propaganda and the bullshit therein, deep lies some truth and some answers to our current frustrations. I just wish it wasn't a super authoritative nation doing such a project, but it's how the world working right now is set up. Most of the wonders were built during authoritative periods of human history. In free nations, such large projects are hardly possible because of the high labor costs and the disconnect between the government and the corporations that run the country. 
Now, unlike the Neom's Lion City, we are going to talk about actual solutions which can help us save the integrity of nature and connect it with our architecture. So, I understand there's a big misconception about what organic architecture currently is. The designers think it's something that's designed according to the shapes found in nature like some flower, wing of a bird or most commonly honeycombs. But it is not that. That is the most basic form of biomimicry and is not organic at all. Organic architecture's correct definition is a type of architecture that resembles nature in its behavior rather than by just how it looks. Organic architecture is chaotic and it grows according to the needs. It cannot be planned simply by gathering some architects. So this simply means there are many issues issues with organic architecture because chaos will inevitably lead to clutter and many unwanted outcomes. Still, we need to understand and adapt organic designs to our architecture because there are some very important lessons we can learn. Let's turn back the pages of time and go when the Kowloon wall city still existed. This unplanned mess of a city had the capacity of 1,255,000 people in one square kilometer or 3,250,000 people in one square miles. If everything was built according to its design for a whole square kilometer or square mile, it still holds the record for being the densest populated constructed habitation. During the 1980s, there were 50,000 residents living within its territory of 2.6 hectares, that's 6.4 acres or 26,000 meters square, that is 2.6 times an average Manhattan city block. Imagine a chaotic city with 50,000 residents in an area almost equal to 4 Olympic size fields. It was a vertical slum to be exact. But you could write a letter to any of the residents living in the walled city and it would be delivered. The one single postman who worked there could easily go to the designated address and ask people for someone's whereabout and get the letter to whom it was supposed to reach. The walled city was a tight-knit community that fended for themselves out of government's jurisdiction and it worked. There was chaos, it was unsightly for people outside the walled city and in total to the government, but for the residents, there was happiness and there was a thriving community. Many of the residents still lament the demolition of the wall city. The government had promised better living conditions, but now the living condition in Hong Kong has actually gotten worse in many places with living spaces of no more than a single bed space for an individual. So what makes Kowloon's wall city so special? Why is it still talked about? Why is it still inspiration for so many modern creations? And why should we learn from it to enhance organic architecture? The wall city was made because it was exactly what people needed. They called it a real life Jenga and it was built out of basic needs to be able for people to survive in a community. Each new portion that was built and added was because it was needed. Now that we have ability to make prefabricated structures that can be disassembled rather than demolished, we can let people decide how they want to live and what they want to add into their houses a bit more freely. We can have more mixed use residential buildings rather than having monotonous suburbs. We could sell the plants we grew ourselves and clothes we needed at home from the shops in our lawns or in our garages. The first jobs of teenagers living in this society could be delivering those goods or learning how to make what they were interested in making from the community itself. Maybe there could be a local market every month near the town halls. Maybe we could have a fully functioning and thriving towns with self-sustaining economies instead of boring old suburbs. Back in the day, suburbs were more viable because they were connected by communal buildings such as churches or community centers where people could mingle with each other. But now, suburbs just isolate us because the communal buildings like churches and community centers, they don't have the same purpose anymore. The suburbs and their current state in many nations are just architecture that's built to further isolate us. There are many things that occupy our time nowadays, technology that is built to isolate us and seclude us from being part of the society. Parents and their children have different political or religious beliefs, but we need to connect not just for our beliefs but to share our lives in other ways as well. But right now we can't even talk to people because of the gaps in our beliefs and we face interpersonal disconnect due to echo chambers and information bubbles we choose to live in. Our daily interaction with someone or a stranger is to take out our phones and to record their public outburst and put it in social media for everyone else to see. We think of ourselves as warriors of social justice by abusing someone's low point in life just to show it off to our followers in social media. Kowloon's wall city, despite being unplanned and chaotic, was where people could connect, work and live. People refrained from doing bad, crazy, stupid things because of the tight-knit society that had actual social consequences. Our cities nowadays don't give us that chance. A criminal or someone who needs help might be living just next doors and we won't even know. So we need to connect with people around us with physical, communal activities, with our art and craft and let each other hear our true voices 
rather than interacting with people using our muffled voices in social media like what I'm doing right now, I guess. And I really do believe that studying organic architecture and applying its best parts can really help us fix this. Now with that said, it's time to learn about another fix. We need to start building by adopting a way which can protect the nature from us and protect us from nature. Not just that, as we are the part of nature ourselves, we must also be able to connect to nature and go adventuring when we so desire. This seems like an impossible task, but it doesn't have to be. We need to take small steps towards this kind of future. Right now, we regularly purge the weeds from our gardens and fields. Open your window to breathe in fresh air and a fly will come buzzing all around your room till you kill it or manage to get it out. Despite all that, we somehow need to practice architecture that doesn't disturb the nature and doesn't let the nature disturb us back. So first, we need to start by fixing our already constructed cities. Bosco Verticale, a building in Milan, Italy, completed in 2014, is a leading example of what a building with a vertical forest can look like. This pair of buildings is an approx 15,000 square meter plot area, and the two buildings cover around 1,800 square meter area within the plot. And in this 1,800 square meter ground covers, because of the vertical forest, it holds trees equivalent to 10,000 square meter area, which is quite an achievement. Almost five times five times the trees. I definitely see vertical forests as the way to balance out the grounds have covered by our built-up area. After almost 9 years of people living in the Bosco Verticale, the residents praise it and it has managed to create its own microclimate amidst the city. This building kick-started the trend of architects stacking the renders of their buildings with trees and shrubs. Nowadays it looks too tacky but Bosco Verticale did something that the copycat architects miss out while putting their trees. The building wasn't an easy thing to build. It cost 40 million euros and the amount of concrete used was numerous times a building with similar size would use, all to be able to handle the additional weight of the trees, soil and the irrigation. Personally, I admired this, building something not just for the residents but to include the nature among the residents as well. But right now, the sad fact is, this kind of neo-greenery can only be enjoyed and accessed by the rich. Unlike the controlled and manicured nature of Bosco Verticale, we will also need free nature that can be accessed by all without having a horde of people roaming around at any given time of the day. This means nature should be around everyone, each and every being out there deserves to be fully connected to the nature. I do hope making vertical forests within our cities become a more accessible option as we already have enough superheated glass and steel skyscrapers. The government they have to take the first initiative to build this kind of buildings because only then we can start scaling it down. And later on we need a residential plan that allows residential buildings and even the buildings will be working in to quickly access the nature. The society will definitely remain broken if only the rich and mighty can enjoy the greenery. I implore all designers to try and figure out your own ideas on how to balance architecture and nature. I'm working on something called reverse Jew cities. I'll show you some pictures but this is still concept and still in its infancy. Imagine a Jew in the middle of your city but now imagine it in reverse. Make the Jew your city and make the city a Jew but a lot more natural with similar interconnections from one zone to another zone opposite of an enclosure, an exclosure and maybe we'll get to go on a safari every day while our cities are protected from nature and protect nature at the same time. This next point is something you have already heard before, more times than you probably wanted to hear it, still I'll still have to provide some insight about this. Instead of huge agricultural lands, farms and pastures, we need to start returning the lands to forests and the nature. This is very important as more land in present day is cultivated land than it is natural. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization in 2023, 38% land that is approximately 5 billion hectares globally is cultivated and 31% land which is approximately 4 billion hectares globally is the forests. Meaning as of right now there is 7% more farmlands than forests. This gap will keep on increasing as governments and people keep on clearing more forests every day for new farmlands. We all know how important forests are. Whoever you are, from any walk of the life, you can never say, hey, Hey, just get rid of all the nature, make farmlands instead, we'll, we'll be all be fine man, we'll all be fine, come on. We know that's not how it's going to work. So what are these alternative ways of food cultivation? We have all heard about vertical farming and terms like hydroponics, aquaponics and aeroponics. As tacky as these terms are, there are solutions here. Only problem, these solutions are too expensive compared to traditional farming on plain land. So how do we convince people to farm in more expensive and resource intensive way? Many countries have done the convincing by tax cuts, subsidies and government support to farmers that wanted to adapt these alternative ways of farming. Next thing that would be a great help is free training and education for farmers regarding these options. And for me, the most important thing about adapting these methods are maybe finally normal people can again take up farming. Normal people who do not own their own farmlands can start farming in their own private spaces, bringing in new ways of self-sufficiency and independence. 
we need to share our constructed and natural spaces more efficiently while also having our privacy. We value our privacy and intimacy with people we care about. We also value the privacy with ourselves. This should never be lost. But we also need to share many things. I'm not saying we should share our houses or apartments, but we do need to share this earth. We can't just launch homeless people into Mars. Just take a look at the empty homes in the world and the people who are homeless at the same time. Many countries easily have more than 10% homes that are permanently packed the year round, especially in the developed regions of the world. In Japan, there's 14% of homes that are permanently vacant. Now compare this to people without homes, 2% of global population is homeless, meaning we could easily house and feed the people. We actually already have the resources too, but we choose not to. Instead we choose to fill our own pockets, fulfill our own vices, and we are trained to look the other way when we see someone who actually needs something. Current world, especially after Covid, the wealth disparity between the rich and the poor has kept on growing. With the advent of AI and the automation and how it is being used, this disparity is not going to stop. Soon, one day, if this keeps on accelerating in this particular direction, we will reach a tipping point. We could lose everything we have worked towards for centuries. Because when people get desperate, they resort to violence and atrocities. Both the civilians and the governing agents are capable of this extreme behavior. This means we need to start realizing the mistakes we are making with the economy and ensure a sustainable future. Not just climate wise, but by ensuring our climate policies do not render people unable to do their jobs. This can only start by improving how we treat our fellow human beings and applying that to architecture, how we build for each other, and also by how we treat our own buildings. Mine. Somehow we need to follow all the above points and still have the sense of individuality, belonging and more importantly the sense of ownership. We are wired to take care of things we own. This is ingrained in us. We love and take care of our family. We take care of our cars and bikes. We are patriotic for our country. It's simple for us and very easy to draw these lines. Although many out there might not like it when I say this, but some of these lines are more fundamentally important. Much more important than lines that decide the border of our countries. If we practice things like reducing our coverage of the earth and having to live in more close-knit compact community while sharing more things, this easily means that we might lose a sense of ownership. Many utopian proposals advertise non-ownership, but it is proven time and again simply by the things like the total failure of communism that the sense of ownership is very important for a functioning civilization. We are hardwired to care only when we have the sense of ownership or belonging upon something. We could say I belong to earth and the earth belongs to me. But this statement is hardly practical as look at us, all the borders we draw every day and even more the war games and political olympics we play in the name of borders. We need to divert our sense of ownership to the whole planet in a loving and sharing way. We can keep and take care of our individual property by ourselves but the planet will need the combined effort of the whole of the human race. Since I'm a jobless, unemployed delinquent at the moment, one of the job interviews I gave very recently was for an architecture firm that is based in Nepal but their work is built in Australia. These architects that work for the said company have never seen the plot of the land they are going to build in, never even been to Australia and experienced the climate over there. In fact, they will never see the work actually be built. They won't even get the pictures. What a tragedy. Since hiring architects is quite expensive in Australia, the soulless construction companies that mass produce copied and pasted buildings have learned to outsource the work to third world countries like ours. These architects over here in the third world might build numerous buildings as a team in a month but they don't know how to actually build the buildings. All they know is how to use the Revit, they are just new as draftsmen. These architects here are paid around 300 American dollars per month and each of them will design around 10 small residential homes every month. Presently, each house built in Australia costs in average around 473,000 American dollars. Meaning if each architect designs 10 houses each month on average, they just get paid $30 to make one home, which costs to build around $473,000. All that money goes to the soulless construction company. And what trickle downs to the designer is 0.00 something percent. And they are probably charging the clients thousands of dollars in design costs while they pay the designer measly $30. This is broken and this travesty needs to stop. And the clients or people who are getting the house in the end might get the result but what good is something built like that? Something built with no soul. This is not just one story that I personally experienced and is among millions of similar case examples. Since the globalization of the world, this sadly has been a common practice. So if you are building a home in Australia, please hire an actual architect and don't let these construction companies spoon feed everything to you. Make a house that you deserve with the hundreds of thousands of dollars of your hard earned money. What I want to say is building a house should be a personal project, a dream of the future homeowner expressed to their architect. 
and the architect translating that into a suitable design. Only then people will get a house that is intimate and is perfectly suited for them. We are in dire need to put soul and reverence back into the architectural practice. But the current design of the world is accelerating in the opposite direction and this will definitely increase more with the improper capitalistic use of AI. So as architects let's not help build a world where the voice of reason will be considered as senseless rants and good actions will be considered as insanity. So in conclusion, everything I discussed above is very challenging to do and it seems impossible, doesn't it? How do we even start to do it? We can't just plant a few trees around our buildings and pretend that oh yes, I'm fixing the nature. That is not fixing the nature. I'm not saying there should not be man-made nature. Gardens are beautiful. Some of my favorite places are gardens. When we inherited the role of the gardeners of this earth, the first thing we did, we started to weed out everything we deemed unsightly and unnecessary and when that came to bite us back. We covered our infected and infested wounds with a blanket and pretended that it's all going to be okay. Is that what we are going to tell our children? Is that the kind of life you want your children to live? We can no longer ignore how we build and design, how we treat each other and our planet. I for one cannot. All of us and especially the designers and the builders, we need to realize our architecture has played a huge part in leading us down this lonely road of mass extension and we need to change before we can no longer share the earth with fellow species. Because if we don't, as we bury those graves of countless that die every year, we might as well start digging graves for our own species. In the end, there is one popular saying that comes to mind. Society grows great when old men plant trees who say they know they shall never sit in. And we are in a dire need of that kind of philosophy in architecture. So I'm going to make one. Architecture can start healing the world when the design can shelter beyond just its residence. Well, it's not polished right now, but I will get it in time. Till then, let's head towards healing architecture so it can heal the planet. Even if we can't fix everything we want right now, let's start by thinking, let's start questioning, let's take one small step, one tiny step towards better earth with each new things we set to design. And that's all for today. So Fry. Was the real moon anything like the moon you used to dream about?